like I'd get khaki. I'm like, it's the first one that comes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm expecting big things now. No oh, no, I got it right here. Hello, everybody. No, I was told. I was told. Oh. It, I was told it was okay. Around. No, I just turned it on. Hello, everybody. Um, if we can get started, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Jim Stevens, not Carl Dobman, uh, as the program says. I'm a chair of the architecture department and a faculty member here in the Department of Architecture. Um, I'm excited tonight. This is the third uh, lecture in our. Uh, department and college lecture series uh, for the semester and uh, so far they've been really great and I'm looking forward to the one tonight. But the one tonight is kind of special to our department specifically um, as it's uh, honoring our next uh, distinguished alumni from the Department of Architecture. And this is a, a really uh, wonderful program where our board of alumni from uh, the college and the department select among their peers somebody they would like to to honor each year and as a part of that um, uh, we host a lecture and a reception afterwards so tonight is that night and we're quite excited about it um, but I'm not going to uh, steal the thunder of introducing that person. I'm going to leave that to Megan Martin Campbell, who is currently the chair of the Alumni Association from the Department of Architecture. So, Megan, if you'd like to come up and make that intro. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Jim, for that introduction. As Jim mentioned, um, I am this year's chair of the College of Architecture and Design Alumni Cabinet. Our cabinet is made up of nine alumni volunteers elected by their peers who each serve a three-year term. It is our goal as a cabinet to provide initiatives which support the ongoing development and success of our alumni so that we may continue to gain value and support from LTU after graduation. Tonight we gather to celebrate the Distinguished Architecture Alumni Award, which is one of three annual initiatives that we believe support these goals. In years past, the cabinet has bestowed only two awards, both of which recognize individuals that have either received a bachelor's or are in pursuit of a master's degree in the College of Architecture. For those, of, for those of you in attendance tonight that have been nominated for the Pellerin Fellowship, just a reminder that your proposals are due soon. <laughs> and I look forward to reviewing the adventures that you've laid out. Over the course of the last year, the Cabinet has developed a framework for a third award. The upcoming spring semester, the Cabinet will recognize its inaugural Distinguished Design Alumni Award recipient. This award seeks to recognize the professional achievements of a single individual or two individuals considered as a partnership that are graduates of the College of Architecture and Design who practice in the field of game art, graphic design, industrial design, interior design, transportation design, or urban design. Our goal with this initiative is to recognize the support of the whole of the alumni from the college. So please join me back here in the spring lecture series, which will include Eric Noss, this year's Pellerin Fellow, and he will present his travels to Finland. He just got back, by the way. <laughs> also, for the alumni dis recognition, the award recognition, but in lecture of our next distinguished design alumni. So enough about that. Enough about the cabinet. Let's get to why we're here tonight. Tracy Sweeney, whose architecture career spans nearly two decades, has been marked by both design awards and tireless volunteer service to the community and to the profession. Tracy is a native of St. Clair Shores. She earned two undergraduate degrees from this institution in 2001, both summa cum laude, a Bachelor of Science in Architecture and a Bachelor's in Fine Arts of Architectural Illustration. She then went on to earn a Master's of Architecture with distinction in 2006. 
Her career includes 12 years as a senior associate and designer at Fanning Howey Associates in Novi, in the past five years as an associate and designer at Harley Ellis Devereaux in Detroit. At Fanning Howey, much of her work concentrated on public library and, and school buildings. Her work for HED has run the gamut from workspaces to libraries to higher education from Detroit to Kuwait. She received the AIA Detroit Distinguished Service Award in 2013, the AIA Detroit Young Architect Award in 2014, and the AIA Michigan Young Architect Award in 2015. Since graduation, Tracy has acted as a mentor to LTU students, and in doing so, she was recognized as the most supportive professional award in 2015 from the LTU student chapter of the AIAS. She, is also the chair, she was also the chair of this cabinet in 2014 and 15. And if that wasn't enough, Tracy is also involved with the Detroit Sessions, a nonprofit which aims to present classical music in new settings to new audiences. She also chairs and serves as the event MC for Pachaka Chak Night Detroit, a fast-paced presentation event invented in Japan and now held in more than a thousand cities around the world, which gives creative people a chance to show 20 slides for 20 seconds, each to present their ideas. On a personal note, I had a privilege to, to be welcomed into Tracy's world at an annual meeting of AIA Detroit a number of years ago. Because let's be honest, this is really her world, and we're just, <laughs> we're just here living in it. <laughs> During our obligatory icebreaker interview exercise, Tracy and I were paired together. I was a bit timid, but Tracy was having none of that. Right out of the gate, she was sharing and effortlessly jumping right into interrogating me. We talked about our profession, our goals, and our lives. As time passes, the detail from that conversation will fade. But her passion, zeal, intensity, enthusiasm, fire, love, and endless pursuit of a cause for art and architecture left a mark on me and everyone she interacts with. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce this year's Distinguished Architecture Alumni recipient, Tracy Sweeney. Okay, so I'm testing to make sure everybody can hear me on the mic. Okay, good. Wow, it's always a bit of a challenge to start after an introduction like that. I'm gonna switch over to the other presentation. Oops. Where'd it go? <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, that was the really hard part, right? Should all be easy from here? So we have a lot to talk about tonight. And I get to wander a little bit because I have a microphone, which is super cool. Um, the first thing I'd like to do, though, is to say thank you to the college, to the past DAA award winners group. It's a real honor to be considered part of that group of people that I have considered friends and mentors and teachers for a really long time. I'd like to thank all of the friends and the colleagues who have helped me with all the things we're gonna talk about tonight, and there's a lot of it, and none of it have I done alone. And so it's important to recognize those people as we kind of walk through this. As it says up here, everything connects, and that's what really struck me as I started to look through materials and what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. Um, there's also some other important people in the audience that I want to recognize. This lecture is dedicated with love to my parents, even though they never got me that pony. <laughs> and uh, that's okay, because they taught me some other important things about being able to take up space, being able to have your voice heard. And they were the ones that were always telling me that everything is possible, and believe me, they paid for that one until I was 16 and I could drive, because they drove me to everything I thought that I could do. And that's probably the best place to jump in for tonight. So we all recognize those <laughs> big milestones of life, right? Those are the ones that if you ask anybody, they're pretty confident what that's all about. 
And the thing is, I think everyone in the room in architecture, or everybody online, because apparently this is being streamed online as well, I'm trying really hard not to think about that, but everybody in the architecture world, excuse me, also recognizes that architecture puts a bit of a spin on that. And so drinking lining up with your first job seems fairly appropriate. Um, NCARB says that the average for licensure is 33 and a third, so that makes that 40 look not so old anymore. That kind of edits that a bit for you. And you're also told that because there's so much to know and there's so much to learn, that you're really not going to do anything good until you're 50. And so you look at that gap, and I can see everybody's faces in the audience right now going, man, you know, that really, really sucks, because that's a super long time. But if you think that sucks for you, look at me today. This is awkward. Because we're here to talk about being a distinguished alumni. But the thing is, the time that I've spent since I've left Lawrence Tech, I've thought a lot about that gap. And every time I talk to a student group, we talk about gaps like these. Because this is the thing that nobody talks about. Everybody in a creative field knows about this. Everybody has felt it. But nobody talks about it, because that's not the cool thing to do. And it's not just architecture, it's all creative fields. And I'm going to pull this out for a second because I don't want to mess up somebody else's words. I'm fine with messing up mine. But for those that don't know, Neil Gaiman is a pro prolific author, um, short fiction novels, comic books, graphic novels. And he tells a story on his blog that I think is really relevant to what I'm talking about, about this idea of the gap and kind of how we feel about where we are. And he says, some years ago, I was lucky enough to be invited to a gathering of great and good people, artists and scientists, writers and discoverers of things. And I felt that at any moment they would realize I didn't qualify to be there, among these people who had really done things. On my second or third night there, I was standing at the back of the hall while a musical entertainment happened, and I started talking to a very nice, polite, elderly gentleman about several things, including our shared first name. And then he pointed to the hall of people, and said words to the effect of, I just look at all these people, and I think, what the heck am I doing here? And I said, yes, but you were the first man on the moon, and I think that counts for something. And I felt a bit better, because if Neil Armstrong felt like an imposter, maybe everyone did. Maybe there weren't any grown-ups. Only people who had worked hard, and also got lucky, and were slightly out of their depth, all of us doing the best job we could, which was all we could really hope for. And so in that context, the gap doesn't feel so bad, does it? We're all a little bit in the same boat. And so in a creative profession, we can spend a lot of time, as Neil said, I only went where they sent me, we can spend a lot of time there. And some of the time we spend there is really valuable. We're learning, we're practicing, we're following others that have gone before us. But then we also need to remember that all of those folks are also making it up. And so sometimes you got to just do what you're going to do. I did not make these graphics up for this lecture. This was actually from a marketing material that we did for a startup for a tech company. And they wanted us to present ourselves in a light that was consistent with the way that they looked at their business. And so it made me think quite a bit about how it is that we present ourselves out in the world. And so the idea is you should mind the gap. There is something about that there. But also realize that on a fairly regular basis, trains come along. And if you time it right, you can step right over the gap and just get going. And here's one of those trains now. So I'm fairly confident that there's very few stories where anything really significant happened on the Detroit People Mover. Pretty sure. But have you ever been in a situation where you had a room full of very creative, very motivated people that weren't 100% sure they trusted each other or what they were about to do? My story about the People Mover starts there. We were in a position where we had a room full of AIA members and also registered architects who had chosen not to be a part of the AIA and people from creative professions all around Detroit. And we were trying to find ways 
that we had things in common instead of the things that we usually argued about. And we said, let's brainstorm something that we can all do together. And so the usual charrette style brainstorming session started and everybody was competing to come up with an idea that was slightly more ridiculous than the one before. Mostly under the thought that if the idea was just ridiculous enough, we might be able to stop with that meeting and not ever actually make anything happen. I forget who it was now that said, well, why don't we make the people mover relevant? And nobody really knew what that meant. But that was the one that we settled on because it seemed like the most impossible of all the ideas. And we thought about it for a while. And what that turned into was something called the People Mover Architecture Conference. As we talked about it more, there was the idea that, hey, maybe in the stations we could do presentations for the people that come through and that everybody laughed and said, there's no one coming through. That's not going to work. It also just didn't quite seem challenging enough. And so what we decided was that we were going to be the first architecture conference in motion, and the conference would actually be on the trains. And so we were proving to ourselves that, number one, we could do that, and number two, more importantly, that we could do that together. As we got into it, of course, we looked at our resources, and they were slim. We had Scott playing someone else's ukulele. <laughs> We had a budget of about maybe $50 that we had scrapped together, and so we printed some signs and put them on yardsticks. We got Party City's finest lays, and by finest, I do mean cheapest. And then we took a good look at what we had to work with in terms of the people mover, because that was the thing that we were really after. We did make some contact with the appropriate authorities, but beyond that, we did a lot of rides on the people mover. We were timing the time between stations. We were looking at the assets and the space that was available at each of the stations. What might we be able to do with that? And thinking about what would it actually mean to move a group of people around, of course, a group of people that we had invited, but a group of people along with whoever happened to have wandered onto the people mover that day. And as we thought about the logistics of it, it re we kind of realized that the easy thing to do would be to put the people on the trains and switch out the presenters. You're on a train and the presenter comes in, and then at another station another presenter comes in, but that's not much different than what we're doing here aside from you happen to be moving and the scenery is changing, so that didn't seem very exciting at all. What we ended up deciding to do was to figure out a way to move the people. The presenters stayed in place, and the added excitement of trying to get a whole group of people on and off the trains at different places, get them off the train, give them a snack, because we were sponsored by Kind Bars. That was the one bit of blessing that we had in terms of resources. But take them off the train, give them a snack, put them back on, and it's a whole new set of people talking. And then we had some bonuses with this as well. We did have a media presence where everybody was kind of doing away on their Twitter and Facebook and um, it was all collected into this media feed. And I was really surprised by some of the photos that came back, including this one, and I know it's a little blurry, but it says report suspicious activity or people and it's a kind of a standard people mover sign and I kind of wondered if they had put that up for us because we were indeed suspicious on that day. And there was so much excitement and so much sharing and just kind of the, the thought that we had done something that was really impossible and nobody wanted that energy to end and we had planned ahead for that. Our friends at Urban Bean helped us get this set up. So we had an urban picnic in one of the traffic lanes in the street in front of Urban Bean. So yes, that is AstroTurf and Linen because we are classy. The cops came, but not to shut us down. They joined the party. And it was just a kind of a fantastic afterglow. And when I say that everything connects, these are some of the photos that I look to because I look at the faces in these photos and I realize there were people there that I didn't know before that event. I might not even really have registered they were there at the time, but they play into so many more of the stories as I got more and more involved in different things in Detroit. So sometimes when you look back at those photos, you realize those times, as Megan was saying, that you remember that first time that you met up with somebody. So if you want to get started doing stuff, that was obviously not my first rodeo. That would be a kind of a difficult one to start with. Um, but the idea here is if there's a lesson here, if you're sitting there and you're looking at the person next to you and you're saying someone should be doing this for young professionals, or this is something I'd really like to see, I've got good and bad news for you. That someone is you. 
So when you see that thing that needs to be fixed, the idea is just go and fix it. Now you don't have to do it by yourself. The first step to doing all of it is to find your tribe. And to do that, you show up. You show up when there's an Affleck House cleanup day for Lawrence Tech. You show up when IDCFC is having their charity kickball game. You show up when someone asks you to come and talk about women in design. You show up when AIS calls you and says, we're having the Beaux-Arts ball, and the theme is Tron, and so you sew fiber optics into a dress and you show up. You show up for the third grade when they ask you to come and talk about the job opportunities in architecture. You show up when AI Michigan has the annual design retreat. And I have to warn you, this is going to happen a couple of times. Shameless plug number one, the design retreat is happening this coming weekend. And so if you still have the opportunity to do that or it's something that happens annually, it's something I would recommend that you give a try to. It's one of the best opportunities for young people and seasoned professionals to be in the same place in a really casual environment and interact. But the whole point here is that you show up like it's your job to all of these things. And you are making connections. And more than that, you are learning things that no matter how hard we try, we're not teaching people in college. I met with a group of students recently, and we were talking about what those sort of necessary skills are. And they were surprised that I spent so much time talking about how we talk to clients and how we almost become friends and about how we learn things about them and the way they work and their families and how when I'm sitting with a client, more often than not, I can tell if they're kind of holding back some information or as we listen along, you kind of poke at it a little bit more. All of those things that I always tell people I do a lot more therapy in the profession than I ever expected to. But the way that you get those skills is by showing up. You learn a lot more about people. You learn about how they interact. You learn what they mean when they say one thing and they do something else. You learn that by showing up. And when you show up, people start to recognize your name and your face. And when opportunities come along, you get the call and you end up in those rooms where really important things sometimes happen. And in the corner of Slows, a little bit more than 10 years ago, was one of those times. And I see Sam smiling, because he helped me out with this one. The next slide is you, buddy. Derek Roberts was associate director at the time. And to my point of when you see something that's a problem, and you say somebody should do something, that somebody is you, Derek saw that at the time, there was not a lot of programming inside AIA for emerging professionals. And it wasn't from a lack of interest. Everybody kept asking us, you know, what should we do? How can we include emerging professionals more? But nothing was really seeming to take off. And so what he did was invited a little bit more than a dozen of us to come sit at a table and have barbecue, which is always a good way to start a meeting and to talk about these issues. What is it that we saw in the profession that we wanted to get into and start to change? And this is a not super attractive flyer from the time, but it shows some of those folks that were involved. And I look at those faces and I look at those names and I recognize some leaders of firms in the area now. I recognize Michael Ford, who I don't know if it's aired yet, but was just talking to Oprah about the hip hop architecture camp that he's involved with. And I see where all of those names went, and so I'm not terribly surprised, looking back on it now, that there was so much success in the efforts that those people in the first Emerging Professionals Committee put in to try to make some changes. And those changes were centered around issues that you wouldn't be surprised about. We were looking for assistance with ARE and with study and with the path to licensure. And the thing was, it wasn't that people didn't want to help us, it was that they didn't know how. And so this group was the best position to say, hey, these are the things that you should really be working on if you want to help us out. We were looking at opportunities to have actual real programming for emerging professionals, not just how do we get emerging professionals to come along to the same things that we've done all the time. And there was also a lot of discussion. This was at the, I would even say pre period before Detroit really started to take off. But there was a sense that 
Coming up really soon was a freight train, and if AIA didn't get on board with the idea that we are part of a creative community and we needed to learn to talk to other creative organizations, we might be in a little bit of trouble. And so the youngest group felt like they were the best positioned with social media, with interactions, with other things they were going out to in the town, with the other creative things that they were involved with to start to have some of those discussions and to start to blur some of those lines. And so under those guidelines, we sort of march forward. The first thing that I think everybody will kind of recognize was this was right around 2007, and that was the time that NCARB had put out um, the resolution on the model law that said, hey, previous to this, like when I went through my process, you went to school and you went through all of your IDP experience and then you took all of your exams, and then after all of that, you would finally become licensed. And for any number of reasons that I probably don't have to explain to you guys, everybody said that seems like it's dragging out a little bit, the results aren't what we wanted, and so we're gonna say that when you get out of school, you can do it concurrently. You can start to take exams, you can do the experience, and it's more what it is now, but that model resolution was released to the states. Michigan said yes, we think that's a fantastic idea, but the challenge is that the actual licensing law needs a legislative change for that to happen. And so all of a sudden, all of us were immer immersed with the, uh, the Government Affairs Committee trying to figure out what did it mean to change a law. We're all just like, hey, people want to take exams. We're not really worried about the law. But that was the path forward to make that happen. And this is the photo on the day when all of the effort was worth it as we stood around Jennifer Granholm, and that was something that was a reality. One of the things I'm really proud of at that very first meeting at SLOWS was there was a new thing called Pachakja that had started up in Tokyo at a firm out there. And their goal was to be able to get a bunch of creative people in a room and just have talks about inspiration. The thing is, when you give an architect a microphone like you guys gave one to me tonight, it's really tough to get it back. And so they started this 20 slides, 20 seconds each format, which means each presenter only gets six minutes and 40 seconds, 20 slides over that time, to tell a story about what they're working on, their inspirations, um, something that they did that day. It just has to be something creative. And so at that first meeting at SLOWS, I said, if we are trying to create a platform where emerging professionals have a voice, and if we're trying to create a place where architects and interiors and sculptors and photographers and all the other creative things that are happening in Detroit come together to celebrate that. And if at the same time we're also trying to create reasons why people would go to Detroit and try out new venues, and of course that's not something that we have to force too hard now, but 10 years ago it really was, this is a solution that does several things all at once, and those are my favorite kinds of solutions. And so we started back then, and so shameless plug number two. We're now on volume 36, so that took off pretty well. Um, October 17th, we'll be at Hunt Street Station. The call for presenters is still open. I'm looking at you guys. So all you have to do is send an email to pkndetroit at gmail.com with your name, contact information, a couple of images, and a short description, and you can be considered for a presentation spot at volume 36, plug over. So as there was more and more success with the Emerging Professionals Committee, what we had hoped to see happen actually did happen, and that was that there was a recognition in all of the other committees of AIA Detroit that considering emerging professionals, considering inclusiveness in all sorts of ways, whether it be emerging professionals or whether it's vendors or whether it's allied professions, that we should be looking for ways to welcome those folks into all those events that we had always done the same way for so long. The celebration of architecture for many years was a beautiful event, but was done as a dinner, as a big celebration, with tuxedos, with fairly high ticket prices that kind of ruled out a lot of emerging professionals. And it wasn't the type of party that you guys would be excited to go to. <laughs> it's very important, but it wasn't that type of party. And so a little more than five years ago, I think, the, the discussion kind of started to center around that idea of 
if we want to target these things, if we want to be more accessible to the public, if we want to invite in allied professionals, if we want the involvement of emerging professionals, what do we do? It was also the time that the Detroit Design Festival was ramping up. And Detroit Design Festival has something called Eastern Market After Dark. And that seemed like the perfect opportunity to jump in because the other people were already there. We didn't have to try so hard to get those other audiences. What we did have to do was to create a really great party. Now, with that said, anyone who has ever tried to amplify anything and hear it in the shed at Eastern Market, that's a pretty big challenge and one that we've been working for a number of years to solve. But to create in there the sense that you have a stage for the presentations and you're also integrating other things. We're putting in unique food concepts. We're introducing fashion. We're introducing music. We're creating sort of an exclusive event at a certain point in the evening. It's open to the public and everybody comes rushing in to see what's going on. This was more of the vision that some of the younger people in that very first EPC meeting had had about the types of events that they wanted their organization to put on. Shameless plug. Next Thursday is the celebration of architecture. And you guys can get in free if you contact AIA Detroit and volunteer to work at the event. They need help setting up during the day and help at the event as well. And shameless plug. So I've been doing a lot of talking about stuff that's not work. Occasionally, you probably have to show up to your real job. And I didn't feel like I could have one of these lectures without touching on that a bit. The projects I'm about to present to you are not presented so much in the sense that I really want you to analyze them as architectural objects. What I want to talk to you tonight is all of the stuff that we've already been through. I kind of promised that you were getting a lot of benefits out of showing up. And as you start to look at the skills that are necessary to go through some of the projects that I'm about to show you, you can see where that level of involvement that degree of kind of defeating some challenges that you didn't think you could get over, that sense of connecting with people are all the skills that are necessary to get you through it. And at the bottom of it all, it's largely about communication. There's so much advice that I could give you about working in the profession, about design, about architecture. But the thing that I'm kind of focused on myself right now is this idea the architecture and design, the difference between the urgent and the important, makes all the difference. There are hundreds of thousands of decisions that go into every project. And you can focus on those day after day, and you get emails, and you have to answer, and there's so much urgency and so much information that people are asking for. But what I've been trying really hard to do is to focus on those couple of things, and usually there aren't that many, the couple of things that if you really put your attention to them, they make all of the difference in the final result. Maybe one way to look at it, I'm sure you've heard the story when Michelangelo was carving David. Several sculptors had tried before on the same blocks of marble, no success. And when Michelangelo, who was still under 30, completed the masterpiece, the Pope looked at it and asked him, like, how did you do this after several other people had tried and failed? And how did you create such an astonishing masterpiece? And he just said, I just took away everything that wasn't David. Which is a little cocky, but when you think about it, it's entirely appropriate. If you're really clear about what you're trying to do, life gets a lot easier. And so for the purpose of this lecture, I scrambled around in some of the notes and some of the stuff that I had from different times, just looking for something that demonstrated that we do this at an early conceptual level. And I guarantee that number two does not say new STDs, it's new standards. <laughs> but when you're looking for an example, beggars can't be choosers. The idea is that early on you are looking for those things that are important and that will make a difference in the project. There's a couple of questions that you can ask yourself that help with this. What is the whole story? Because the thing is, I'm sure even as students, you're accustomed to maybe getting a program or getting some information. And you can like really start to crank on that and produce something. But is that the whole story? One of my favorite clients, and I know we're not supposed to have favorites, but I'm going to go ahead and say it, even though this is recorded for all eternity. They were New World Systems at the time, and now they're Tyler Technologies. 
And these guys are computer programmers. And so the first day that we went in there, they are problem solvers. And so they walked us up to a couple of boards and they said, look guys, it's all figured out. <laughs> and in a way, it kind of was like, they had done a lot of thought about what they needed and who was there and how much space all of it would take. And my personal favorite is this one right here, if we zoom in a little bit, right at the edge of the board were all of these shapes. And we were like, yeah, yeah, what do you guys know? And we looked at this and we saw that shapes were associated with square footage sizes. And we're like, okay, I get that. And you've got a number over there. But then they said, no, 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 you don't understand. A circle has only one line. And so that room is for one person and a square has four. And so that room is for four people. And as we dug into it, there was so much information in this stuff that they had put together. And they had spent so much time on it and so much analysis. And their faces fell when I said, OK, you're halfway there. Because they were really sure that they had figured all of it out. And they said, what do you mean? What's missing? Like, everything is here. I promise you, all the numbers add up. And everything fits, and it's good. And I said, I know. But I want you guys to be really proud of this when it's done. And so what I need to ask you is I've got all the numbers. I know everybody that needs to fit in there. But what do you want it to feel like? Who are you guys? When somebody walks in, what do you want this space to tell them? And what they told me after only the briefest of pauses was Tron-like. <laughs> and I was super excited because I already had that dress. It was awesome. But we started to talk a little bit more about what that would mean. And they told me, they said, we really want this idea of Tron Lake, but the problem is we do software for municipalities, and a lot of our clients wouldn't be so sure about it if we were too fancy, or we were too edgy, or it was a little bit too much off the wall. And we're really attached to this idea of having something cool. We want something great for our people, but how do we reconcile those two things? And so we started to play this game with each other of what could we sort of sneak into the design that if I didn't tell you Tron Light, you might not have picked up on, but that they would know. And so they would have kind of a, a secret code among those that work there, and they would know something that nobody else did. And so we thought about what Tron meant, and we're thinking about speed and linearity and long lines and, of course, the light, because you can't get away from those lines of light. And that was right about the time that all the manufacturers came out with those continuous light fixtures. And we knew that we really had a handle on something that we could use for them. So here, we've cut back into a typical suburban office building and really cut their lobby back and created something very transparent and very welcoming that you wouldn't expect otherwise. And then that light that comes from the lobby zooms back into the center of that space and does the predictable trend thing and goes across the ceiling and then bends down the wall. They know what that's all about, and I think by now we've seen that in a number of other places, but at the time, it was the super coolest thing they've ever seen. And the challenge with this office building was that their ground floor spaces were about half of the first floor, and then the rest of their offices were on four and five, so there was this big disconnect. So of course, we took that same language and put it in the elevator lobbies of the different floors so that they would have that sense of continuity as they went from place to place. And once we had developed that language and we kind of understood how you apply it in sort of these super secret ways, we started to talk about their culture. And they really were the kind of team that wanted to all come around a big table. And so this one was dubbed the BAT by the client. It shows up on the drawings as the BAT, and that stands for Big Ass Table. And they're super proud of that, so proud, in fact, that they had the whole team on the day that it was built crawl underneath and sign it as a testament to kind of the teamwork that had gone into the project. And those are the kinds of things that mean so much to me as a designer, that we got it right and that they felt like this was their space. So let's talk about potential. Potential is a little bit the designer's superpower. Because what we forget is that other people look at things and can't necessarily see the future condition. We look at them and we can kind of imagine what something could be like. We sometimes get hung up on the idea that we think of potential as the thing that happens up until the building gets built. 
and don't think about the potential of it after. And there's two examples here that kind of handle each one of those conditions. The first one, you guys will recognize this building down the road. I can't tell you too much about everything that we've been working on over there because we have a developer who is asking us to do test fits for different clients. And of course, most of those test fits have a lot of logos and a lot of things that identify who might be considering that building. So we can't talk about that today. But I wanted to show this one from the standpoint that if you notice, very little has been done to this architecturally. And I want you guys to think about that. What we did, though, is activated it with light. We activated it with human stories. You look at this, and you can begin to imagine what's happening inside the building. We showed a couple of umbrellas on sort of that mid-level roof walkway. And that's shorthand in the human brain for like, hey, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to have a coffee. We're going to do some work. It's going to be a fun place to be. These are the elements, these kind of storytelling human pieces that are not really architectural pieces that convey so much more to the people who are considering looking at this building. We got a call on the back side of the building. The owner said, they've been there, they've seen it, they're not impressed, and by tomorrow morning, I need you to give me something that makes it look like it's not that building. Okay. So through the power of Photoshop, again, we got started and put some things into here. But again, look at the kinds of games that we're playing with this. I can't really tell you what any of those materials are. And it doesn't really matter at the stage of project at which we are. It's about the potential. It's about kind of scraping away some of the stuff that has come over time. It's about transparency. It's about materials. It's about the mood. What time of day did I set that at? And they actually, the client actually called me, they're like, is that dawn or dusk? Because I'm concerned if we need to like, make some adjustments. I'm like, guys, really? <laughs> but when you put the mood into the rendering, you get an emotional attachment to that project that you didn't have before. An emotional attachment you certainly didn't have to this photo. And those are the types of things early on that we're looking at in marketing materials, in developing these kinds of test fits. Now what I find interesting is we easily, as designers, accept that these early things are about potential. We kind of stop thinking about that in terms of built projects, and I'd like to show this one. I had to separate it from Tron or else you guys are going to think that all I do is science fiction projects. Um, that is a robot with a lightsaber in the front. But the reason that I put this one under potential is that Lansing Community College had a new program, the Center for Manufacturing Excellence. It was grant funded, they have a lot of partners in the industry, and they needed a space. This is attached to a whole rest of the complex, so it doesn't sit on its own. It needed to be special. It needed to be visible. It needed you to be able to look in there and see what was going on. What's more than that, there were, of course, the spaces where they did the things that they needed to do. But instead of a big warehouse space, we're connecting it with light. We're getting some interaction going back and forth. But it was the corridors and the in-between spaces that we spent the most time talking about it. And I, I can't really think of another project that we ever spent that much time talking about those in-between spaces and how you come in. But in this particular project, it was all about potential. And think about it from their point of view. They're grant funded. They have partners. They give tours constantly to new students, to partners, and to people from the government that they want to go around talking about what a great thing this new program is. And all of that is part of the description of what we're trying to do as designers here. You could have a project by which we provided a corridor and there's some space for robots and everything's cool. But if that was all it was, we didn't do our job. The last one I'd like to share has not gotten very far yet. It's still definitely on the boards. Um, Sagatuck Douglas Library just went out for funding for the second time and got it passed. And so this is something that we're going to start working on with them. They're currently in an old church building in the middle of Douglas. And I'm not sure how much everybody knows about the community, so I'll just say that it is a seasonal community. It's a resort community. And so the needs of the library, unlike many of the other libraries that I've worked on, change with the seasons. And so there's something in that that we knew from day one was going to need to be picked up in the design. The other challenge here is that it's a library that serves multiple communities. 
And so Douglas, which is a bit more on the traditional side, Saga Tech, which is the arts community and is kind of looking at things in a totally different way, and the township, which is kind of a much larger area, but it's a farming community, all three of them look at this building and think about it in very, very different ways. And so when you're at the point of trying to sell a millage to the community, your job is to set up some guidelines with which the design will proceed later and to not tick too many people off. So that gets a little tricky. So we started with the idea of the traditional forms. In Douglas, you see along the bottom, the, the right two are of the library, but you see the other buildings are in town and all of the institutional buildings in the town have kind of that white-sided look. They have a consistent look to the way they are. And you'll notice that all of them are two stories. And very quickly, we started hearing from people, you know, the, the new building needs to be kind of like this, but just move to the new site. And it should be two stories, and it should be sided, and the windows should be arranged like this. And if you guys could put some of that detail on there, that'd be great. Part of the challenge of that, as I'm sure you can kind of, as you think about libraries, you can understand, is that libraries have certain challenges or certain maybe even opportunities that you need to look at when you think about how to put a library together. And so how we explained it to them was kind of like this. We said if you take that form that you're used to, and we used the old school, so it was something that they were familiar with, and we cut it down to one story, because we know you love the two story, but in reality for a 9,000 square foot library, you would never, never build two stories. Just from a supervision standpoint, from a maintenance standpoint, the fact is you already have trouble with your elevator. How many times in the last year has someone been stuck in your elevator for 9,000 square feet? It's something that you want to get away from. We don't want to be into all the problems that you had before. And everybody kind of looked at it, and they're like, all right, I see where you're going with that. And then we said for libraries, you're looking for that sheltered space that when you're, you have a kid waiting to be picked up and they've got their backpack and all the stuff that they have some place to have some shelter underneath. You're looking for visibility. In a modern library, you want to be able to look in and see the activity and see stuff going on around the computers and see the shelves and see into all of the inner workings. And that's not necessarily something that you're getting from the building that we started with. And so like, maybe we suggest that there's some moves there that we might eventually want to make. Kind of made sense. And then we said, what would be the opportunity if we took it and sliced it the other way? And so you're not necessarily seeing from the front what I'm doing here, but we get the opportunity to bring some daylight into the heart of the building. You get the opportunity to create a shift that maybe if you keep the roof a little longer, here's a portion of the plan. Up on the top there, on the right hand side is their program room. I talked earlier about how this is a seasonal community. And so the idea is that in the summer, they have really, really huge programs. This is when all the kids come rushing in. This is where the hugest story times happen. This is where, when the resort community is full and you've got clubs and you've got all of those types of things, the need for a room is so much bigger, but I don't need a room that's that big all year long. And so by extending the roof kind of along that shift, we get the opportunity to have half of our program space indoors, which is appropriately sized for the winter months and half of it outside, and then we can play some games with that glass in between. Is it something that's a wall that completely removes itself, or is it something like this that there's just visibility back and forth? And this one simple move, the efficiency of it, kind of how much it made sense when you explained that it was really tailored to the community and the way that they used the library, it was a move like this that got that yes vote. And so as much as this is a rendered view of what a building could look like, it's not really necessarily intended to be the end product. But it's intended to stand in for a series of decisions that would both have a building that feels like it belongs, but answer the needs of modern service and answer the needs that everybody else is saying that you know we need this to feel like it's open to the community. We need this to feel like it's a part of who we are now. So, last thing. Let's talk about the care and feeding of designers. Because <laughs> we never overwork. We, we never do all-nighters. When you're in the creative professions, 
and you're doing those types of things and you're working, you're close to burnout. What we sometimes forget is that creative people get inspiration by testing their skills and going out and finding new contexts within to look at things, finding different ways to look at the things that they look at all the time. And so as much as Michelangelo never would have said it to the Pope, you know that sometimes he was saying, I just went out and tried a few things that weren't dated. I love this. I have to buy this from the internet before it's not available anymore. (laughs) But the idea is just that you take something that you are very, very familiar with and you look at it in a completely different way. And so all of those skills that you're using at the office, And all of those skills that I talked about at the very beginning when I started to talk to you guys about being there and showing up and organizing, it's about finding ways to remix those things, finding ways to remix the things that you're good at and that are important to you. And for me, one of those things has been the Detroit sessions. And Megan mentioned that earlier. Um, I got involved in this in kind of a sneaky way, and I'm looking at Yvonne right now. I'm going to start to talk about him, and everybody can stare at him in a minute because he's here tonight. But a mutual friend at one point got a hold of me and just said, Trace, I, I know you're busy, but we have this challenge. Like, we need a poster for an event, and I know that you can do it. Like, can you whip something out for us really quickly? And the event was a performance by Yvonne at the DSO. And I said, sure, you know, poster's no big deal. And then I started to talk to them about what the Detroit Sessions was really about. And it is about classical music, but it's about presenting it in new contexts. It's about finding new ways to talk about it and, and new ways to attack it, and really about creating a new culture for classical music. And I got super excited by that, and so I dove in a little deeper than a poster and a program. I helped a little bit with the programming for that night, and so we started to see the opportunity to introduce visuals that really had something to do with architecture and with Detroit. Um, To introduce some other creative disciplines, there was dance involved. We had an afterglow. Over on the right-hand side is my friend Emily, who's the first female DJ in the NBA for the Pistons, DJ Thornstriker. You saw her earlier in the... uh, the train images if, if you're paying attention. And so we were trying to create a little bit of a difference. You, you can kind of have a mental idea of what an event at the DSO is like. And we wanted it to be a little different from that. But while everybody was out in the afterglow, my favorite part of the night was that until they actually threw us out of the auditorium, this is what Yvonne was doing. And so the idea of taking classical music and reaching entirely new audiences, just looking at the faces of those kids and understanding what would it mean to you if the thing that you wanted to do most in the world like this, that someone said, come up on the stage of Orchestra Hall and play the piano. And that really meant a lot to me in terms of what we could do in reaching out to the community And I was a little concerned after that that I wouldn't be involved anymore until like the next day when Yvonne said, I got a new idea. And so that new idea was he wanted to drop a piano in the street in Detroit was what he told me, but then as it developed, it wasn't really the street, it was Corktown, and then it wasn't really Corktown, it was Roosevelt Park. And then before I knew it, we were involved in a major production with Blue Water and Mark's Lane with $80,000 of in-kind involvement and a 30-foot smoke-breathing robot. And the night before, until 2 o'clock in the morning, we were sitting there getting all the setups for everything and all of this light and looking at what could be done with the train station. This was way before Ford. This was way before anybody was really paying attention. And we're putting all of this up there. And people are driving by and asking what movie we're making. And I apologize that the photos are not what they could have been, because we can still see what this show would have been. But on the day of the show, it looked like this. And it got only worse than that. That was the only monsoon that summer on that day. And it was our only opportunity to do the show. And so if I had to count the top 10, maybe the top five disappointments in my creative life, this ranks among them. But the idea is that nothing was really lost, aside from the fact that we didn't get to show people what had been put together. Because from the standpoint of the Detroit Sessions, we had a really good record of what we had done. We proved 
that the group was able to put on a production like this. We did lose the opportunity to simulcast to Berlin, but we had the ability to show people what was possible. We had made connections with Blue Water that we still have to this day. We made connections with the community. We had, what was it, 1,000 or 1,200 people on Facebook that were all interacting with us over this event. The amount of excitement around this particular project kind of jettisoned us forward. And so as much as there was disappointment here, I think this time it might have taken three days for Yvonne to get back to me. If we can't simulcast to Berlin, we're going to bring the world to us. And so we got a violinist and filmmaker from Paris and a cellist from the Ukraine and did an entire centenary tribute to Menahan. It was a big performance at the DIA. One of Bruno's films was shown as well. And it was the first time that I was able to see a classical music audience that was acting like they were at a rock concert, honestly, by the end. There was so much excitement around what was done here. And again, we were involved with those same partners. And all of this, the three events that I've talked about, all happened within the span of four months. And to understand that all of that was possible, while I'm looking at my guys right here at ATD, they didn't really see me drop off in terms of what I was producing for work at that time, although I did tell Yvonne there was a chance I was going to get fired if we didn't get this done maybe just a little bit faster. But all of that in four months, and that kind of stuck with me. Since that time, we've had other opportunities to do things that have been really interesting to me, both in a creative and sort of a, an understanding how spaces react type of way. All of these are what we called secret sessions. They were all done at the Jam Handy in Detroit. And each of them is a very unique and separate event, all, even though they were all done in the same place. And so we focused on big scrims of artwork by Lisa Spindler. We focused on live art performance. We brought other artists into the space. We recorded a legacy album for Dr. DiChiara. And I have to say, for a girl whose only musical talent is karaoke in the style of just because I can't really sing doesn't mean I won't sing. I didn't really ever imagine that I would be part of a production that was considered for a Grammy. To be able to touch that is kind of special. And then just last week, we did another festival centered around the DIA, this time about Rostropovich. And what I appreciate so much about the effort here, aside from the fact that there were six events in the course of four days, yeah, I look embarrassed, that's fine is that the storyline here was as much about the music as it was about the life of Rostropovich. And for those that don't know, this is a man who stood up for someone else in a country where he wasn't free to do so and paid a very, very heavy price. For years, he was thrown out of his own country because he behaved in that country as if he was free when he didn't really have the freedom to do that. And so it's amazing to me that we're able to put on events like this, again, this time with the help of Blue Water projection mapping to the space. That's the Berlin Wall behind. One of the things that Rostropovich had done was came to the Berlin Wall when it was coming down and played for the people that were there. But sort of that attachment and the idea that kind of that almost Grammy and almost changing the world just keeps me going. So that brings me up to current times, aside from one last shameless plug, that as I pointed out, every time we do one of these, Yvonne gets a hold of me two days later, and I told him, until this lecture is over, he's not allowed to talk to me. So I don't know what the next thing is for the Detroit sessions, but I know we've got some good stuff coming up, so watch for that through social media. But since we're caught up, I have to go do some more stuff, and I hope you do too. Thank you guys very much. Okay, so I just need to know when you sleep, because uh, I feel like such an underachiever at this point. Um, I guess uh, we do have just a couple minutes for questions. We are going to have a little time uh, in a reception in the Brick Crowley following, but if anybody has any immediate questions, I can take those now.
Question. Yeah, yeah, I know. But at first, I need to ask the question. Questions? Well, we have one more thing to uh, present to you, and then we're going to all go uh, have, some, have some refreshments. But really quick, to set it up so you know what it is. Um, me personally, I'm not a collector. I don't really, I actually shun collection because I don't want stuff. But I have a few weird things in my office that I refuse to get rid of because they're like talismans of my teaching and they connect me to like incredibly special moments with students and they're, they're things that I just can't bring myself to get rid of. So that's, I'm not a collector, other faculty members may be collectors, uh, but we all have those talismans that connect to students. So with that, I want to ask uh, Professor Rudy to come down. And I'll let her explain to everybody what this is. <laughs> I have a feeling I know what this is. <laughs> I'll let you explain it. Just, here is your sketchbook Thank from you. art history class that I had in It's my not even falling apart. I'm not as old as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> that um, was in my office for 18 years. And mm -hmm. every time I taught art history, I would haul out your sketchbook as the finest example of a sketchbook that Thank has you. ever been done. And you have a drawing of uh, Michelangelo's David in there. So um, I thought, you did learn something after all. You remembered that. A couple things, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, was, um, I kept it for all those years. And when I cleaned my office, I thought, you know, I've got to start returning some of this stuff. So there you go. There's your <laughs> Thank you button. so much. You're welcome. So please join us in the Brick Gallery, which is directly across uh, on the other side of the building. And we're going to have refreshments. And you can see pinned up on the wall some of Tracy's work. And thank you again, Tracy. It was thank fantastic. Thank you, guys. Now you can plan another event. <laughs>